Hello, hopefully we're live. Just waiting for our man in the sound booth, otherwise known as Noah, to let us know if we are live and how we're sounding. Hopefully we are sounding well. Feeling good uh, with that sound there, Noah? Any minute now. Hopefully we can get that cleared up. And let me tell him now. Hey, Noah. Noah, 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 Noah. Can you hear me? Okay, you know what? We're just going to assume that uh, uh, people, uh, that we're good. And so, I'd like to say hello and welcome to another live reading from Virus Free Radio. Uh... Uh, we uh, Noah's asking for a guitar riff to dial in Ryan. Is that riffy enough for you, Noah? Okay. All right, so moving on, folks. I just want to welcome you to uh, our reading of the Callahan Chronicles by uh, we have to look at the chat so that we can communicate yeah I was reading the cha uh, chat <laughs> and said we get a guitar riff but anyway sorry about that folks so and today we will be bringing you the collection of short stories by Spider Robinson known as the Callahan's Chronicles set for in the appropriately place uh, named place known as Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, or as the regulars simply call it, Callahan's. It's the neighborhood tavern in all of time and space where the regulars are anything but, well, they're time travelers, talking dogs, alcoholic vampires, cybernetic aliens, and a group of people who truly, really care about each other. It's a rare kind of place where bad puns are as appreciated as good conversation. With me, as always, is our resident minstrel, Ryan. So for this one, folks, it's all a collection of short stories, uh, all taking place in Callahan's and stories uh, brought to you by the patrons of said watering hole. We'll be bringing to, uh, them to you uh, as we go along. But before we get into that, I'd like to take a moment just to read you the foreword that uh, Spider wrote uh, at the beginning of this book. And I thought that it bared uh, sharing, just because it's funny. So, the foreword by Spider Robinson. Books get written for the damnedest reasons. Some are written to pay off a mortgage, some to save the world, some simply for lack of anything better to do. One of my favorite anecdotes... Uh, uh, concerns a writer who bet a friend that it was literally impossible to write a book so B.A.D. bad that no one could be found to publish it. As the story goes, the writer proceeded to write the worst, most hackneyed novel in which he was capable, and not only did he succeed in selling it, the public demander demanded better than two dozen sequels. I can't tell you his name. His estate might sue, and I have no documentation. Ask around at any science fiction convention, it's a re reasonably famous anecdote. This book, as it happens, was begun for the single purpose of getting me out of the sewer. I mean that quite literally. In 1971, after seven years in college, with that magic piece of paper clutched triumphantly in my fist, the best job I was able to get was night watchman on a sewer project in Babylon, New York, guarding a hole in the ground to prevent anyone from stealing it. God bless the American educational system. With, that one th with one thing and another, I seem to have a lot of time on my hands. So I read a lot of science fiction, a custom I have practiced uh, assiduously since, and at the age of six. I was introduced to Robert Heinlein's rocket ship Galileo. One evening, halfway through a particularly rigid example of Sturgeon's Law, 90% of science fiction, or anything, is crap, according to Sturgeon's Law, I sat up straight in my chair and said, uh, perhaps for the 10,000th time in my life, by Jesus, I can write better than this turnip. 
and a light bulb of about 200 watts appeared in the air over my head. I had written a couple of stories already, and, uh, and actually had one uh, printed in a now defunct fanzine called Zrimpf. Hilariously enough, one of the crazies who produced Zrimpf was the editor who bought this book that you hold in your hands, Jim Finkel. But my entire output at the time could have uh, been fit into a business envelope, and its quality might be most charitably described as shitful. On the other hand, I had never before had the motivation I now possess. I wanted out of the sewer. It was time to become a pro. I realized uh, from previous failures uh, that, as a tyro, it behooved me uh, to select a subject I knew thoroughly, as I was not yet skillful enough to bluff convincingly. Accordingly, I selected drink. Within a week, I had completed the first chapter of this book, The Guy with the Eyes. Looking in a library copy, a copy of Writer's Guide, I discovered that there were four markets for my masterpiece. I noted that Ben Bova paid five cents a word and everyone else paid under three, and that's how my lifelong friendship with Ben began. I mailed it, and he bought it, and when I had uh, recovered from the shock of his letter of acceptance, I gathered my nerve and rang him up timidly to ask if editors ever uh, con uh, uh, consented to write a few uh, minutes answering the naive questions of beginning uh, authors. Ben pointed out that without writers, editors couldn't exist, and invited me to lunch. And when I walked into the analog office, uh, stumbling over the occasional Hugo, very nearly the first thing he said was, Say, does that Callahan's place really exist? I'd love to go there. Since that day, I estimate that I've been asked that question about uh, 5,372 times 10 to the 10 times by virtually every fan I meet. One gentleman wrote to me complaining bitterly uh, because I said in The Guy with the Eyes that Callahan's was in Suffolk County, Long Island, and he wanted me to know uh, that he had, by God, spent six months uh, combing every single bar on Long Island without finding the place. I seem to have struck a chord. Well, I'm sorry, but I'll have to tell you the same thing I told those 5,372 times 10 to the 10 other people, as far as I know. Callahan's place exists only between A, my ears, B, assorted analog and vertex covers, and, of course, C, the covers of this book. If there is, in fact, a Callahan's place out there in the so-called real world, and you know where it is, I sincerely hope you'll tell me, because I'd really like to hang out there for a while. February 1976, Finney's Cove, Nova Scotia. So that gives you a little glimpse into the life of the author. But now, folks, let us uh, pull up our stools, have a drink, and listen to the yarns of the goings-on of Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, starting with the story, The Guy with the Eyes, by Spider Robinson. Callahan's place was pretty lively that night. Talk uh, fought Budweiser for mouth space all over the joint, and the beer nut supply was critical. But this guy managed to keep himself in a corner without uh, being noticed for nearly an hour. I only spotted him myself a few minutes before all the action started, and I make a point of studying everybody at Callahan's place. First thing, I saw those eyes. You get used to some haunted eyes in Callahan's. The newcomers have them. But these reminded me of a guy I knew in Topeka, who got uh, four people with an antique revolver before they cut him down. I hoped like hell he'd visit the fireplace before he left. <clears throat> now, if you've never been to Callahan's place, God's pity on you. Seek it in the wilds of Suffolk County, but not uh, for neon. A simple uh, hand-lettered sign illuminated by a single floodlight and a heavy oaken door split in the center by the head of one Big Beef McCaffrey in 1947 and poorly repaired. Inside, several heresies. First, the light is about as bright as you keep your living room. Callahan maintains that people who drink in caves are unstable. Second, there's a flat rate. Every drink in the house is half a buck 
with, uh, with the option. The option operates as follows. You place a $1 bill on the bar. If all you have on you is, is a fin, you trot across the street to the All Might Deli, get change, come back, and put a $1 bill on the bar. Callahan maintains that nobody in his right mind would counterfeit $1 bills. Most of us figure he just likes to rub fistfuls of them across his face after closing. You are served your poison of choice. You inhale this and confront the option. You may, as you leave, pick up two quarters from the always full cigar box at the end of the bar and exit into the night. Or you may, upon finishing your drink, stride up to the chalk line in the middle of the room, announce a toast, this is mandatory, and hurl your glass into the huge old-fashioned fireplace, which takes up most of the back wall. When you depart without uh, visiting the cigar, you then depart without visiting the cigar box, or pony up another buck and exercise your option again. Callahan seldom has to replenish the cigar box. He orders glasses in such quantities that they cost him next to nothing, and he sweeps out the fireplace himself every morning. Another heresy. No one watches you with accusing eyes to make sure uh, you take no more than the quarters you have coming to you. If Callahan ever happens to catch someone cheating him, his personality ejects them forever. Sometimes he doesn't open the door first. The last time he had to eject someone was in 1947, a gentleman named Big Beef McCaffrey. Not too surprisingly, it's a damned interesting place to be. It's the kind of place you hear about only if you need to, and if you are very lucky. Because, if a patron, having proposed his toast and uh, smithereened his glass, uh, feels like talking about the nature of his troubles, he receives the instant, undivided attention of everyone in the room. That's why the toast is obligatory. Many a man with a, a hurt uh, locked inside finds in the act of naming his hurt for the toast that he wants very much to talk about it. Callahan is one smart hombre. On the other hand, even the most tantalizingly cryptic toast will bring no uh, prying inquiries if the guy displays no desire to uncork. Anyone attempting to flout this custom is promptly blackjacked uh, by Fast Eddie, the piano player, and dumped in the alley. But somehow, uh, many do feel like spilling it in a place like Callahan's. And you can get in a deeper insight into the human nature in a week than in ten years anywhere else I know. You can also quite likely find solace for most any kind of trouble, from Callahan himself if no one else. It's a rare hurt that can stand under the advice, help, and sympathy generated uh, by upwards of 30 people that care. Callahan loses a lot of regulars. After they've been coming around long enough, they finally don't need to drink anymore. It's that kind of a bar. I don't want you to get a picture of Callahan's place as an agonized Alcoholics Anonymous type of group encounter session with Callahan as some sort of a salty psychoanalyst father figure in the foreground. Hell, many's a toast that provokes roars of laughter or a shouted chorus of agreement or a unanimous blitz of glasses from all over the room when the night is particularly spirited. Callahan is a tolerant of any Ranny Gazoo. He maintains that a bar should be merry, so long as no bones are broken unintentionally. I mind the time he helped uh, Spud Flynn uh, set fire to a seat cushion to settle a bet on which way the draft was coming. Callahan exudes, at all times, a kind of monolithic calm. And uh, you, uh, us uh, 40 is sh uh, shorter than his temper. This night, I'm telling you about, for instance, was nothing if not merry. When I stumbled in around 10 o'clock, there was an unholy shambles of a square dance going on in the middle of the floor. I laid a dollar on the bar, collected a glass of Tullamore Dew, and, uh, and a hello grin from Callahan, and settled back in a tall chair. Callahan abhors uh, bar stools. And began to observe the goings on. That's what I mean about Callahan's place. Most bars, men only dance if there's ladies around, of one sex or the other. I picked uh, some familiar faces out of the maelstrom of madmen weaving and lurching over honest-to-god sawdust and waved a, few, waved a few greetings. 
There was Tom Flannery, who at the time had eight months to live and knew it. He laughed a, a lot at Callahan's place. There was Slippery Joe Miser, uh, who had two wives, and Matty Mathis, who didn't gamble anymore, and Noah Gonzalez, who worked in Suffolk County's bomb squad. Calling for the square dance uh, while performing a charitable Irish jig was Doc Webster, fat and jovial as the day he pumped the pills out of every stomach uh, and ordered me to Callahan's. See, I used to have a wife and daughter before I decided to install my own brakes. I saved $30 easy. The doc left the square dancers to their fate, their creative individuality making a color superfluous, and drifted over like a pink zeppelin to say hello. His stethoscope hung unnoticed from his ears, framing a smile like a sun lamp. The end of the scope was in his drink. Howdy, doc. Always wondered how you kept that damn thing so cold. I greeted him. He blinked like an owl uh, with the staggers and looked down at the gently bu uh, bubbling pickup beneath two fingers of scotch. Emitting a bellow of laughter at about force eight, he removed the gleaming thing and shook it experimentally. My secret's out, Jake. Uh, keep it under your hat, will you? He boomed. Maybe uh, better keep it under yours, I suggested. He appeared to consider this idea for a time while I speculated on one of life's great paradoxes. Sam Webster, M.D. The doc is good for a couple of quarts of Peter Dawson at night, three or four nights a week. But you won't find better sawbones anywhere on earth, and those sausage fingers of his can move like a tap-dancing centipede when they have to, with nary a tremor. Uh, ask uh, Shorty Stintes uh, to tell you about the time Doc Webster uh, took out his appendix on top of Callahan's bar, while Callahan calmly kept the scotch coming. At least then I could hear myself think, the doc finally replied, and several people uh, seated within earshot groaned theatrically. Have a heart, doc, one called out. That's a repulsive idea, the doc returned in the serve. Well, I know when I'm beat, said the challenger, and uh, made as if to turn away. <clears throat> Why, you young whelp, I aorta poke you one, roared the doc and the bar exploded with laughter and cheers. Callahan picked up a beer bottle in his huge hand and pegged it across the bar at the dock's round skull. The beer bottle, being made of foam rubber, bounced gracefully into the air and landed in the piano, where Fast Eddie sat locked in mortal combat with the Sea Jam Blues. <clears throat> Fast Eddie emitted a sound like an outraged transmission and kept right on playing, though his upper register was shot. The uh, little beer never uh, hot a piano, he sang out as he uh, reached the bridge and went over it uh, like he figured to burn it behind him. All in all, it looked like a cheerful night. But then I saw uh, the Jansen kid come in, and I knew there was trouble brewing. This Jansen kid. Look, I can't knock long hair. I wore mine long when it wasn't fashionable, and I can't uh, knock pot for the same reason. Nobody I, I know ever had a good thing to say for heroin, certainly not Joe Hennessy, who did two weeks in the hostel last year after he surprised the Jansen kid uh, scooping junk money out of his safe at four in the morning. Old man Jansen paid Hennessy back every dime and uh, disowned the kid. He'd uh, been in and out of uh, sight ever since. Word was he was still using the stuff, but the cops never seemed to catch him holding. They sure did try, though. I wonder what the hell he was doing in Callahan's place. I should know better by now. He placed a tattered bill on the bar, took the shot of bourbon, which Callahan handed him silently, and walked to the chot line. He was quivering with repressed tension, and his books squeaked on the sawdust. The place quieted down uh, some, and his toast, to smack, rang out clear and crisp. Then he downed the shot, uh, mid an expanding silence and flung his glass so hard you could hear his shoulder crack just before the glass shattered on unyielding brick. Having created silence, he broke it with a sob. Even as he let, uh, let it out, he glared around to see what our reactions were. Callahan's was immediate, and amen, that sounded like an echo of the smashing glass. 
The kid made a face uh, like he was somehow satisfied in spite of himself and looked at the rest of us. His gaze rested on Doc Webster, and the Doc drifted over and gently began rolling up the kid's sleeves. The boy made no effort to help or hinder him. When they both were rolled to the shoulder, uh, phosphorescent purple, I think they were, he silently held out his arms, palm up. They were absolutely unmarked. Skinny as hell and white as a piece of paper, but unmarked. The kid was clean. Everyone waited in silence, giving the kid the respectful attention. It was a new feeling to him, and he didn't quite know how to handle it. Finally, he said, I heard about this place, just a little too truculently. Then uh, you must have needed to, Callahan told him quietly, and the kid nodded slowly. I hear you get at some answers in from time to time, he half asked. Now and then, Callahan admitted. Some of the damnedest questions, too. What's it like, for instance? You mean snack? I don't mean bourbon. The kid's eyes got a funny faraway look, and he almost smiled. It's... He paused, considering. It's like... being dead. ooh wait came a voice from across the room. That's a powerful good feeling indeed. I looked and saw it was Chuck Sams talking and watched to see how the kid would take it. He thought Chuck was being sarcastic and snapped back. Well, what the hell do you know about it anyway? Chuck smiled. A lot of people ask him that question in a different tone of voice. Me, he said, enjoying himself hugely. Why, I've been de uh, dead is all. It's truth, Callahan confirmed as the kid's jaw dropped. Chuck there was legally dead for five minutes before the doc got his pacemaker going again. The crumb died owing me money. I never had the heart to uh, done his widow. Sure was a nice feeling too, uh, Chuck said around a yawn. More peaceful than nap time in a monastery. If it wa uh, wasn't too pleasant, I wouldn't be near so damn scared of it. There was an edge to his voice as he finished, but it disappeared as he added softly. What the hell would you want to be dead for? The Jansen kid couldn't meet his eyes, and when he spoke, his voice cracked. Like you said, Pop, peace. A little peace of mind, a little quiet. Nobody yammering at you all the time. I mean, if you're dead, there's always a chance uh, somebody uh, will mourn, right? Make friends with the worms, dig their side of it. Maybe a little poltergeist action. Who knows? I mean, what's the sense of talking about it anyway? Didn't any of you guys just ever want to run away? Sure thing, said Callahan's. Sometimes I do it, too. But I generally run someplace I can find my way back from. It was said so gently that the kid couldn't take offense, though he tried. Run away from what, son? asked Slippery Joe. The kid had been bottled up tight so long he exploded. From what? he yelled. Jesus, where do I start? There was this war they wanted me to go and fight, see? And there's a place uh, called College. I mean, uh, they want you to care, dig it, care, uh, care about this education trip. And they don't care enough themselves to make it as attractive as the crap game across the street. There, uh, there's this air I hear is unfit to, to breathe, and water that ain't fit to drink, and food that wouldn't uh, nourish a vulture, and a grand outlook for the future. You can't uh, get to a job without the car you couldn't afford to run, even if you were working. And if you found a job, it'd pay $5 less than the rent. The TV advertises karate classes uh, for four-year-olds and up. The president's new clothes didn't wear very well. Uh, the next depression's around the corner, and you ask me what in the name of God I'm running from? Man, I've been straight for seven months. What I mean, that in uh, seven goddamn months, I've never uh, been over this island like a fungus, and there is nothing for me. No jobs, no friends, no place to live long enough uh, to get the floor dirty, no money, and nobody that uh, doesn't point and say junkie when I go by I, uh, for seven months, and you ask me what I'm running from, man, everything is all, just everything. That it was right then that I noticed this guy in the corner, the one with the eyes. Remember him? He was leaning forward in rapt attention, 
his mouth a black sash, and a face pulled tight as a drumhead. Those ghastly eyes of his never left the Jansen kid, but somehow I was sure that his awareness included all of us, everyone in the room. And no one had an answer for the Jansen boy. I could see, all around the room, men who had learned to listen at Callahan's place, men who had learned to empathize, to want to understand and share the pain of another. And no one had a word to say. They were thinking past the blurred words of a haunted boy, wondering if this crazy world of confusion might not, after all, be one holy hell of a place to grow up. Some of them already had reason to know damn well that society never forgives the sinner, but they were realizing that to their own dismay how thin and uncomforting the straight and narrow had become these last few years. <clears throat> sure, they had heard these things before, often enough to ma uh, make them into cliches, but now I could see uh, the boys reflecting on these uh, uh, cliches that made young men say like they w uh, wanted to feel dead. And the same thought uh, was mirrored on the face of each of them. My God, when do we let things, these things become cliches? The problems of today's youth were no longer a, a Sunday supplement or a news broadcast or anything so remote and intangible. They were, uh, they were suddenly become a dirty, shivering boy who told us uh, that in this world we had built for him with our sweat and our blood, he was not only tired of living, but so unscared of dying that he did it daily, sometimes for recreation. And silence held court in Callahan's place. No one had a single thing to say, and the guys seemed to know it, and, uh, and to derive uh, some crazy kind of bitter inner satisfaction from the knowledge. He started to settle in his chair when Callahan broke the silence. So run he said. Just like that. Flat, no expression. Just so run. It hung there for about ten seconds while he and the kid locked eyes. The kid's forehead started to bead with sweat. Slowly, with uh, shaking fingers, he reached under his leather vest uh, to his shirt pocket. Knuckles white, he held out a flat, shiny black case about four inches by two. His eyes never left Callahan's as he opened it and held it up so we could all see the gleaming hypodermic. It didn't look like it had ever been used. He must have stolen it. He held it up to the light for a moment, looking uh, uh, up his bare, unmarked arm at it. And then he whirled and flung it case and all into the giant fireplace. Almost as it shattered, uh, it, it sent a cellophane bag of white powder with it, and the powder burned green, uh, while the sudden stillness hung in the air. The guy with the eyes looked oddly stricken in some interior way, and he sat absolutely rigid in his seat. And Callahan was around the bar in an instant, handing the Jansen kid a beer that grew out of his uh, fist and roaring, Welcome home, Tommy. And no one in the place was very startled to realize that, not, uh, that only Callahan of all of us knew the kid's name. We all sort of swarmed around then, and swatted the kid on the arm some, and even cried a little uh, until we poured some beer over his head, and pretty soon it began to look like the night was going to get merry again after all. That's when the guy with the eyes stood up, and everybody in the joint shut up and turned to look at him. That sounds melodramatic, but it's the effect he had on all of us. When he moved, he was the center of attention. He was tall, unreasonably tall. Near seven foot, I'll never know why he hadn't, uh, we hadn't noticed him uh, right off. He was dressed in a black suit that fit worse uh, than a Joliet special, and his shoes didn't look right either. <clears throat> After a moment, you realized that he had a left shoe on the right foot, and vice versa. But it didn't surprise you. He was thin and deeply tanned, and his mouth was twisted up, up tight, but mostly... Uh, he, he, he was his eyes, and I still dream of those eyes and wake up sweating now and again. They were like windows into hell, the very personal and private hell of a man faced with a dilemma he cannot resolve. They did not blink, not once. He shambled to the bar. Something was wrong with his walk, too. 
like he was walking sideways on the wall with magnetic shoes and hadn't quite caught the knack yet. He took ten uh, new singles out of his jacket pocket, with, uh, which struck me as an odd place to keep cash, and laid them on the bar. Callahan seemed to come back from a far place and hustled around the behind of a bar again. He looked the stranger up and down, and then placed uh, ten shot glasses on the counter. He filled each with rye and stood back silently, running a big red hand through his thinning hair and regarding the stranger with clinical interest. The dark giant uh, tossed off the first shot, shuffled to the chalk line, and said in oddly accented English, To my profession and hurled the glass into the fireplace. Then he walked back to the par and repeated the entire procedure, ten times. By the last glass, uh, Brick was uh, chipping in the fireplace. When the last, to my profession, echoed in the air, he turned and faced us. He waited, tensely, for question or challenge. There was none. He half turned away, paused, then swung back and took a couple of deep breaths. When he spoke, his voice made you hurt to hear it. My profession, gentlemen, he said in a funny accent I couldn't place, is that of advanced scout. For a race whose home is many light years from here, many, many light years from here. He paused, looking for our reactions. Well, I thought, ten whiskeys and he's a Martian, indeed. Pleased to meet you. I'm Popeye the Sailor. I guess it was pretty obvious we were all thinking the same way, because he looked tired and said, It would take more than ethanol th uh, than that to befuddle me, gentlemen. Nobody said a word to that, and he turned to Callahan's. You know I'm not intoxicated, he stated. Callahan considered him professionally and finally said, Nope, you're not tight. I'll be a son of a bitch, but you're not tight. The stranger nodded thanks, uh, spoke thereafter directly to Callahan. I'm here now three days. In two hours, I shall be finished. When I'm finished, I shall go home. After I have gone on, your planet uh, will be vaporized. I have accumulated data that will ensure the uh, annihilation of your species when they are uh, assimilated by the masters. To them, uh, you will seem as cancerous cells in danger of infecting all you touch. You will not be permitted to exist. You will be cured. And I uh, uh, repent me of my profession. Maybe I wouldn't have believed it anywhere else. But at, Hallican but at Callahan's place, anything can happen. Hell, we all believed him. Fast Eddie sang out, Anything we can do about it? He was serious for sure. You can tell with Fast Eddie. I am helpless, the giant alien said dispassionately. I contain installations, which are beyond my influencing or yours. They have recorded all the data I have perceived in these three days. In two hours, a present mechanism uh, will be triggered and will transmit their contents to the masters. I looked at my watch. It was 11.15. The conclusions of the masters are foregone. I cannot prevent the transmission. I cannot even attempt to. I am uh, counter-programmed. Why are you in this line of work if it bugs you so much? Callahan wanted to know. No hostility. No panic. He was trying to understand. <clears throat> I'm accustomed to take pride in my work, the alien said. I make safe the path of the masters. They must not uh, be threatened by warlike species. I go before to identify danger and to see its neutralization. It is a good profession, I think. I thought. What changed your mind? asked Doc Webster sympathetically. This place, this bar, place we're in, it's not like the rest I've seen. Outside are hatred, competition, morals elevated by the status of ethics, prejudices elevated to the status of morals, whims elevated to the statu status of prejudices, all things with which I am wearily familiar, the classic symptoms of disease. But here is difference. Here is the place I sense qualities, attributes that I did not know your species possessed. 
attributes which everywhere else in the known universe are mutually exclusive of the things I have perceived here tonight. They are good things. They cause me great anguish for your passing. They fill me with hurt. <laughs> oh, that I uh, might lay down my gaze, he cried. I, d I did not know uh, that you had had love. In the echoing stillness, Callahan said simply, Sure we do, son. It's maybe spread thin a little these days, but we've got it all right. Sure it would be a shame if it all went up in smoke. <clears throat> he looked down at the rye bottle he still held in his big hand, and absently uh, drank off a couple of ounces. Any chance that your masters uh, might feel the same way? None. Even I can still see that you must be destroyed if the masters are to be safe. But the first time in some thousands of years, I regret my profession. I fear I can uh, do no more. No way you can gum up the works? None. So long as I'm alive and conscious, the transmission will take place. I could not assemble the volition to stop it. I have said, I am counter-programmed. I saw Noah Gonzalez's expression soften, and heard him say, Geez, buddy, that's hard lines. A mumbled agreement rose, and Callahan nodded slowly. That's tough, brother. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. He looked at us with absolute astonishment. The hurt in those terrible eyes of his, uh, of his mixed now with bewilderment. Uh, shortly handed him uh, Shorty handed him another drink, and it was like he didn't know what to do with it. Tell us how much it will take, mister, Shorty said respectfully, and we'll get you drunk. The tall man with a uh, star-burned skin groaned from deep within himself and backed away until the fireplace uh, contained him. He and the flames ignored each other, and no one found it surprising. What is your matter, he cried. Why are you not destroying me? You fools, you need only to destroy me and you are saved. I am your judge, I am your jury. I will be your executioner. You didn't ask for the job, Shorty said gently. It ain't your doing. But you don't understand. If my data is not transmitted, the masters will assume my destruction and avoid the system forever. Only the equal or superior of a master could overcome my defenses. But I can control them. I will not use them. Do you comprehend me? I will not activate my defenses. You can destroy me and save yourself and your species, and I will not hinder you. Kill me, he shrieked. There was a long, long pause, maybe a second or two. And then Callahan pointed to the drink Shorty held out and growled, You better drink that, friend. You need it. Talking of killing in my joint, wash your mouth out with bourbon and get out of that fireplace. I want to use it. Yeah, me too came on the cry for all sides, and the big guy looked like he was going to cry. Conversation started up again, and Fast Eddie began playing, I don't want to set the world on fire, in a very bad taste indeed. <clears throat> Some of the boys wandered thoughtfully out, going home to tell their families or to settle affairs. The rest of us, uh, either lacking concern or, uh, or nowhere else to go, drifted over to console the alien. I mean, where else would I want to be on Judgment Day? He was sitting down now, with booze of all kinds on the table before him. He looked up at us like a wounded giant, but none of us knew how to begin, and Callahan spoke first. You never did tell us your name, friend. The alien uh, looked startled and sat absolutely still, rigid as a fence post for a long, long moment. His face twisted up awful, as though he was w uh, waging some titanic inner battle with himself, and cords of muscle stood up on his neck in what didn't seem to be the right places. Doc Webster began to talk to him softly. Then the alien went all blue and shivered like a steel cable under the strain, and very suddenly relaxed all over with an audible gasp. He twitched his shoulders experimentally a few times, like he was making sure they were still there. And then he turned to Callahan and uh, said, clear as a bell, my name is Michael Finn. It hung in the air for a long time, while uh, we all stood petrified, suspended. 
Then Callahan's face split in a wide grin, and he bellowed, Why, of course. Why, yes, yes, of course, Mickey Finn. I didn't recognize you for a moment, Mr. Finn, as he trotted behind the bar. His big hands uh, worked busily beneath the counter, and as he emerged with a tall glass of dark fluid, the last of us got it. Uh, we made way eagerly as Callahan set the glass before the alien and stood back with the utmost deference and respect. He regarded us for a moment, and to see his eyes now was to feel warm and proud, for all the despair and guilt and anguish and horror, and most of all the hopelessness were gone from them right now. They were just eyes, just like yours or mine. Then he raised his glass and waited, and we all drank with him. Before the last glass was empty, his head hit the table like an anvil, and we had to pick him up and carry him back out to the back room, where Callahan keeps uh, a cot, and you know, he was heavy. And he was, uh, and he snored in three stages. And with that, the story of the man with the eyes comes to an end, folks. Turns out you can uh, uh, put off uh, the end of the world, uh, at least for a little while, by, uh, by getting the Angel of Dead good and plastered. I think we can drink to that, right, Ryan? There we go. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Fancy another one? Another round, barkeep. Another tale. This time, see what I, you'll see what I did there in a moment. This one's called The Time Traveler. Of course, we should have been expecting it. I guess the people at Callahan's read newspapers just like other folks. And then there had been a discotheque over at the John Jericho Turnpike hit three days earlier. But somehow how none of us were prepared for when it came. Well, how are we to know? It's not that Callahan's place is so isolated from the world that you never expect to be affected by the same things. God knows most of the troubles of the world, old and new, come through the door of Callahan sooner or later. But they usually ha have a dollar fist in their dollar bill in their fist and not a point four five automatic. Besides, he was such a shrimpy little guy. And on top of it, it was Punday night. Punday night is a weekly attraction at Callahan's. If that's if that's the word. Uh, folks uh, come into the place uh, for the first time on a Tuesday evening have been known to flee screaming into the night, leaving full pitchers of beer behind in their haste to be elsewhere. There's Sunday Sea, and then there's Monday, and then there's Punday. And on that day, the boys begin assembling around 7.30, and after a time, people stop piddling around with their drafts and start lining up pitchers. And Fast Eddie gets up from his beat-up straight piano and starts uh, putting tables together. Everyone begins ever so casually jockeying for position. So important on Punday night. Here and there, the newer men can be heard warming up uh, with one another, and the first groans are heard. Say, Fogarty, I hear tell uh, Stacy Catch was engaged to the, the same girl three times. E every time the big day came due, uh, she decided uh, she couldn't stand it. Do tell. Yep. Then uh, the late Harry Truman himself advised her, said, Gal, if you can't stand the keech, get out of the hitchin'. And another three or four glasses hit the fireplace. Of course, the real regulars, the old timers, simply uh, sit and drink their beer and conserve their wit. They add li uh, little to the shattered welter of glass that grows in the fireplace, though the toasts, when they make them, uh, can get pretty flashy. Along about 11, Doc Webster comes waddling in from his rounds, and the place hushes up. The Doc uh, uh, suffers uh, his uh, top coat and bag to be taken from him, collects a beer mug full of uh, Peter Dawson's from Callahan's, and uh, takes his place at the head of the assembled tables uh, like a liner coming into port. Then, folding his fingers over his great belly, he addresses the group. What is the topic? At this point, 
the fate of the evening hangs in the balance. Maybe you'll get a good topic, maybe you won't. And the only way to explain what I mean is by example. Fast Eddie, says Callahan, how about a little inspirational music? What would uh, bring the problem into scale, said Doc Webster, and the battle is joined. I had already noted that, uh, comes uh, the hasty uh, repast uh, from Shorty uh, Stintes. And over on his right, long drink McGonagall snorts. Uh, you've cleft me in twain, he accuses, and Tommy Jansen advises him to take a rest. And by the time uh, that Callahan can point out, this ain't a music hall, it's a bar, they're off and running. Once a topic is established, it goes in rotation clockwise from Doc Webster. If you can't supply a stinker when it's your turn comes up, you're out. By one o'clock in the morning, it's usually a tight contest between the real pros, all of them acutely aware that everyone is still in the lists by closing uh, gets his night's tab erased. It has become a point of honor to drink a good deal on Punday night uh, to uh, show how confident you are. When I first noticed this and asked Callahan's whose idea Punday had been in the first place, he told me he couldn't remember. One smart fellow, that Callahan. This one night in particular had used up an awful lot of alcohol and one hell of a lot of spiritual fortitude. The topic was one uh, uh, of those naturals uh, that can be milked for hours. Electricity. It was about 1.15 that the trouble started. By this point, in a harrowing evening, the competition was down to the dock, Noah Gonzalez, and me. I was feeling uh, uh, decidedly punchy. I have a feeling uh, this is going to be a good, uh, good round, Fermi. The dock mused and sent a few ounces of scotch past an angelic smile. You've galvanized us all once again, Doc, said Noah immediately. Sock it to me, I agreed enthusiastically. The doc made a face, no great feat, considering that he, what he had to work with, and glared at me. Why are you debasing this contest with slang, he intoned. Oh, I don't know, interceded Noah. It seems like an acceptable current usage to me. You see, doc, I said disparagingly, beginning to feel the strain now. Uh, Noah and I see, uh, seem to be in agreement. But Doc Webster wasn't looking at me. He wasn't even looking in my direction. He was staring fixedly over Noah's right shoulder. I regret to inform you all, he said with the utmost calm, that the gent at the bar is uh, not a packing a lightning rod. About 30 heads spun around at once, and sure enough, there was a guy in front of the bar with a .45 automatic in his hand, and Callahan was staring uh, equitably into the medicine end. He was holding out a salt shaker in his huge, horny fist. What's that for? the gunman demanded. Might as well salt that thing, son. You're about to eat it. Now, your run-of-the-mill stick-up artist would react to a line like that by waving the rod around a little, maybe even picking off an odd bottle behind the bar. This fellow just looked more depressed. He didn't look like a stick-up artist if it came to that. I'd have taken him for an insurance salesman down on his luck. He was short, slight, and balding. His gold-rimmed glasses uh, pinched crucially at his nose. Uh, his features were utterly nondescript, a Walter Mitty character of despair. I couldn't help remembering uh, that some sort of uh, notable assassins have been Walter Mitty types. Then I saw Fast Eddie over at the piano uh, slide his hand down to his boot, for the little blackjack he carries for emergencies, and began trying to remember if my insurance was paid up. The scrawny gunman locked eyes with Callahan, holding the cannon steady as a rock, and Callahan smiled. Want a drink to wash it down with, he asked. The guy with the gun ran out of determination all at once and lowered the piece, looking uh, around him vaguely. Callahan uh, pointed to the fireplace, and the guy nodded thanks. The, uh, the gun described a lazy arc and landed in the pile of glass with a sound like change rattling in a pocket. You might almost have thought the gun had uh, shattered a window that kept out a storm, but the whooshing sound that followed was really only the noise of a couple of dozen guys all exhaling at the same time. 
Fast Eddie's hand slipped back into his leg, and Callahan said softly, You forgot the toast, friend. I expected that to confuse the guy, the guy, but it seemed he knew something about Callahan's place after all, because he just nodded and said and, and made his toast. To progress. I could see people all stand up and down the bar, firing up their uh, uh, guzzers, and nobody opened his trap. We waited to see if the guy felt like telling us what his beef uh, with progress was, and when uh, you understand that, you'll have gone a long way towards understanding what Callahan's place is all about. I'm sure anywhere else, uh, folks figured that a man who'd just waved a gun around owed him an explanation, if not a few teeth. We just sat there, looking noncommittal, and hoping he'd let it out. He did. I mean, progress is something with no pity and no purpose. It just happens. It chews up all you ever know and spits out things you can't understand, and the only value it seems to have is to make a few people a lot of money. What the hell is the sense of progress anyway? Keeps the dust off you, said Slippery Joe, uh, Joe Miser seriously. Now Joe, as you know, has two wives, and they sure as hell ain't no dust on him. I suppose you're right, said the clerical-looking burglar, but I truly appreciate a little dust just at the moment. I was hip-deep in it for years, and I didn't know uh, how uh, well off I was. Well, take this to cut it with, said Callahan, and held out a gin and gin. As he handed it over, his other uh, hand came uh, up from behind the bar with a sawed-off shotgun in it. I'll be damned, said Callahan, noticing it for the first time. Uh, forgot I had that in my hand. Put it back under the ball, and the balding bandit swallowed. Now then, brother, pull up a chair and tell us your name. And if you've got troubles I never heard before, I'll give you uh, the case of your choice. Make it I. W. Harper. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Harper, Ooh, uh, said Doc, with uh, the last rising syllable occasioned by Long Drake McConnell's size nines having come down on the Doc's uh, instep. Pretty quick on the uptake, that Long Drink. My name's Humpton, the fellow said, picking up the drink. Thomas Humpton. I'm a... He took a long pull. That is, I used to be a minister. And then God went and died, and now what the hell do you do, is that it? Asked Long Drink with genuine sympathy. Something like that, Humpton agreed. He died of malaria in a stinking cell, uh, in a stinking little town, in a stinking little banana republic called uh, Paslea, and his name was Mary. Ice cubes clinked uh, against his teeth. Your wife? Asked Callahan after a while. Yes, my wife. No one dies of malaria anymore. Do you know that? I mean, they licked that one years ago. How'd it happen? Doc asked gently. And as Callahan refilled his glasses, the time traveler told of his story. Mary and I, he said, had a special game we played between in ourselves. Oh, all couples play the same game, I suppose. But we knew we were doing it, and we never cheated. You see, as many of you are no doubt aware, it's often difficult for a man and a woman to agree. Sustained audience uh, demonstration signifying hearty agreement. Even a minister and his wife. Almost any given course of action will have two sides. She wants to spend Sunday driving in the country, and he wants to spend it watching the fo uh, football people sell razor blades. How is the dilemma solved? Often by histrionics at ten paces. She will emote feverishly on the joys of a country drive, entering a uh, rapture as she portrays the heart-stopping beauty to be found along Route 25A at this time of year. He in turn will roll his eyes, saw his hands as he attempts to convey through the wholly inadequate vocabulary of word and gesture how crucial this particular game is to both the history of football and the scheme of things. The winner gets, in lieu of an Oscar, his or her own way. It's a fairly reasonable system, based on the theory that the pitch of your performance is a function of how important the goal is to you. If you recognize that you're being outacted, you realize how important this one is to your spouse, 
and you acquiesce. The not cheating comes right here. It's not hamming it up just to be the winner. Unless, rarely, that's the real issue. And admitting that you've been topped. That's why when Mary brought God into the argument, a highly unfair last-ditch gambit for a minister's wife, I gave in and agreed that we would spend my vacation visiting my sister, Corrine. I had given up a congregation over in Sayville, not very far from here. Frankie Mary and I had uh, all the Long Island we could take. We hadn't even any plans. We decided to take a month's vacation, the first in several years, and then decide where to settle next. I wanted to spend the month with friends in Boulder, Colorado, and Mary wanted to visit her sister in a little uh, fly-speck banana republic called Pezea. Corrine uh, was a nurse with the Peace Corps. They hadn't seen each other for seven or eight years. As I said, when a minister's wife begins to tell him about uh, missionary zeal, it's time to capitulate. We said goodbye to my successor, Reverend Davis, promised to send a forwarding address as soon as we had one, and pushed off in the winter of 1963. We divided the voyage uh, between discussing the growing unpleasantness in a place called Vietnam and arguing over whether ultima uh, to ultimately settle on the east or the west coast. We both gave uncertain, shaky per performances, and the issue was tabled. Meeting Corrine for the first time, I was terribly struck by the dissimilarity of the sisters. Where Mary's hair was rich, almost chocolate brown, Corrine's was decidedly vivid red. Where Mary's features were around, Corrine's were square, with uh, pronounced cheekbones. Where Mary was small and soft, Corrine was long and lithe. They were both very, very beautiful, but the only characteristic they shared was a profundity of faith uh, that had nothing to do with heredity, and which went quite well with Corrine's fiery sense of purpose, as with Mary's quiet certainty. Paisaia turned out to be a perfect comic opera Central Amer American country presided over by a small-time tyrant uh, named De Villa. The hospital, where Corrine worked, was located directly across uh, the Plaza de Placeo uh, from the palace which gave the square its name. De Villa had built himself an immense mausoleum of an imitation castle from which to rule. About about the same time that the hospital was built, with much the same sources of funding, Pazea, you see, exports maize, sugarcane, a good deal of mahogany, and oil. As Corrine led us past the palace from the harbor, I commented on the number of heavily armed guardias, in groups of five, each of which had their own commissario, who stood at every point of entry uh, to the huge stone structure with their rifles at the ready. Corrine told us that the revolution was brewing in the hills in the north, under the leadership of a man named Miranda, who, with absurd uh, inevitability, had styled himself El Supremo. Mary and I roared with laughter at this final cliché, and demanded to be shown uh, someone uh, talking uh, Asensia. Without cracking a smile, Corrine led us uh, around behind the hospital, where f four mule-drawn carts were filled with khaki figures taking a siesta that never ends. You cannot deal with problems of Paisea by changing the channel, Tom, she said soberly, and my horror was replaced uh, by both a wave of guilt and a wistful, uh, palpable, palpable version of Boulder in the spring, which, of course, uh, only made me feel more guilty. We dined that night in a miserable excuse for a cafe, but the food was tolerable and the music was quite good. Considering that the two women had not seen each other for years, it was not surprising that the conversation flowed freely. And it kept coming back to El Supremo. I have heard it said uh, uh, that his cause is just, Green told us uh, over coffee. And I certainly can't argue otherwise, but the hostel is filled with the byproducts of his cause and I'm sick of revolution. It's been worse than ever since de Villa had Miranda's brother shot. Good God, how did that come about, I exclaimed. Pablo Miranda used to run this cafe, and he never had a thing to do with the revolution. In fact, an awful lot of militant types used to uh, drink in a much more villainous place on the other side of town, rather than embarrass Pablo with their presence. Uh, but after El Supremo blew up the armory, Davila went a little crazy. 
A squad of Gardeas came in the door and cut Pablo in half. Things have been accelerating ever since. People are afraid to travel by night, and Davila has his thugs on double shifts. There are rumors that he's bringing in trucks and a cannon and a lot of ammunition from the United States for an expedition to clean out the hills, and the American embassy is awfully tight-lipped about it. What kind of a ruler is Davila? Harry asked. Oh, an absolute thief. He robs the peons dry, breaks off all he can, and I'm sure the country would be better off if he'd never been born. But then, there are some conflicting reports about El Supremo, too. Some say he's a bit of a butcher himself, and of course, he's a communist, although God only knows what that means in Central America these days. I began to reply when we heard an ear-splitting crash from outside the cafe. Glasses danced off the tables and sh uh, shattered, and pandemonium broke loose. Three men scrambled to the door to see what had happened. And th as they reached the doorway, a machine gun spoke, blowing all three back into the cafe. They lay as they fell, and Mary began to scream. Tom, Corrine shouted over the din of gunfire and panicking people, we've got to get to the hospital. How do we get out? I yelled back, ra uh, raising and lifting Mary from her seat. This way. Corrine led us through the jabbering crowd to a back exit, at which were gathered a good number of people too frightened to stick their heads out the door. I was inclined to agree with them, but Corrine simply walked out into the night. I glanced at Mary, she returned my grace serenely, and we followed. There were no sudden barks of gunfire, and the revolutionaries were not really interested in anyone within the cafe. They were simply shooting anything that moved back in the plaza. As I helped Mary through the dark streets behind Corrine, I tried to figure the way uh, back to the hospital, but I could not recall where the back door of the cafe lay in relation to the door through which we had entered, but it seemed to me that we would have to cross the plaza. I called to Corrine and she halted. As I, as I came to her, a volley of gunfire sounded off to our left, ending in a choking gurgle. Considering what you've told us about Miranda's uh, egregious charm, I said as softly as a heaving chest would let me, Hadn't I uh, better get two of you, la you two ladies to the American Embassy? It's built like a fort, and it lay on the side of the, of the pla on this side of the plaza. The hospital is very short-staffed, Tom. Was all Corrine replied, with a total absence of facial expression or gesture. But I kn uh, knew I could never equal a performance like that in a lifetime of trying. As she spun on her heel and continued walking, Mary and I exchanged a long look. And she's a rank amateur, I said, shaking my head sadly. She and I used to do summer stock together, she said, and we followed Corrine's uh, disappearing footsteps. Crossing the plaza turned out to be more difficult than juggling poison darts. Uh, the few who shot at us were terrible marksmen. By the time it was necessary to cross open space, most of the fighting had centered around the palace itself, and both sides were in general uh, too much busy to waste good bullets on three civilians running in the opposite direction. But as we reached the hospital, I glanced over my shoulder and saw trucks pulling around the corner of the building into the plaza, uh, towing cannon behind them. As we raced uh, through white corridors towards the emergency room, I heard the first reports and then nothing. The artillery provided by the U.S. State Department uh, got off exactly three rounds. At that point, we later learned, a bearded man appeared in the palace balcony overlooking the carnage in the square and heaved something down onto the, uh, uh, the trampled sward. It was Davila's head. Sensing the political climate uh, with credible speed, the uniformed cannoneers uh, worked up a ragged cheer and the revolution was over. But not for us. The maimed and wounded, who continued to be uh, brought in through the night, gave me my first real understanding of the term walking nightmare, until you have spent a couple of hours collecting random limbs and organs for disposal, I, I will thank you not to use the term yourself. I had rather naively assumed that the worst would be over when the battle stopped, but that turned out to be only the signal for the uh, rape and plundering and settling of ancient grudges, which uh, got a good deal uglier. I tried to get Mary to take a few hours sleep, and she tried to get me to do the same. Although we both put on the performance of a lifetime, neither of us could concede defeat. It was about three the next afternoon when I heard the scream. I left one of uh, Davila's rurales 
uh, to finish uh, sewing up his own arm and sprinted down a crowded hall towards the surgery where Mary and Corrine had been for the last 13 hours. It sounded as though the scream had come from there. It had. As I burst in the door, I saw Mary first, in the uh, impersonality-efficient uh, grip of the largest man I've ever seen in my life. Then I saw Corrine, struggling with a broad-backed revolutionary who was throttling a uniformed patient on the operating table. The crossed bandoliers over his shoulders rolled and fell as he strangled, uh, as though he wanted to uh, be there more than to simply clenching his fingers. Corrine's failing fists, uh, uh, no, he noticed, not at all. She was undoubtedly stronger than I. I wasted no time in tugging at the madman's shoulder. I picked up the nearest heavy object, a water pitcher, I believed, and bounced it off the back of his skull as hard as I could. He sighed and, uh, and crumpled, and I whirled around uh, toward the giant that held my Mary. You shall not have done that, senor, he said in a deep, soft voice. The man on the bed? He once did a discourtesy to Pedro's wife. A grave discourtesy. You get out of this room at once, Corrine snapped in her best drill sergeant voice, shaking with rage. The man shook his head sadly. I'm afraid not, senorita, he rumbled. Hands like shovels tightened around Mary's biceps, and she still had not uttered a sound since I burst in. Senor, the giant said to me, you must please put down that pitcher, or I will be forced uh, to do your own wife a small discourtesy. I started. Ah, you see? I know who you are. I would not wish to be discourteous to the wife of a man of God. The gorilla on the floor began to stir, and the huge man sighed. I'm afraid it's all over for you, Padre. Pedro, he uh, is a most unreasonable man uh, when he feels his honor is at stake. You hit him from behind. Kareen snarled and leapt at him, and I followed suit. Even together, we could not budge him or his iron grip, but we kept him too busy to hurt Mary, and I think we might have eventually have prevailed. But suddenly something large and heavy smashed into my left kidney, and I fell to the floor, gasping with pain. Through the haze, I saw Pedro, his tangled hair soaked uh, blood on the side, step over me, reach for Mary, and my soul died in my chest. Then my ears rang with a shot, and I twisted about on the floor to see a tall man with a bristling mustache framed in the doorway, a smoking automatic in his hand. He wore the shapeless khakis, uh, uh, the ma uh, shapeless khakis of the mountains and there was an easy arrogance in his smile, which he regarded with all of us. Behind me, there was a thud as a body hit the floor. Half blind with pain, I uh, contrived to roll over again and saw that the pistol shot had taken off the top of Pedro's skull. There is that about martial law, said the man in the doorway with sardonic amusement. It's addictive. I suddenly managed to sit up bracing myself against a large oxygen bottle. Who are you, I managed. The lean, mustached man uh, bowed low. Permit me to introduce myself, Padre. I am El Supremo y El Aristio, Señor Manuel uh, Concepcion de Miranda, the current ruler of this republic. You, in turn, are the Reverend Huntman, and I must assume that the charming lady there, release her at once, Diego, is your wife, Mary. His excellent English uh, bespoke an unusual degree of education, and his bearing was a studied calm of nobility. I began to believe that we three might survive the afternoon for the first time in what seemed like hours. How do you all uh, seem to know who we are, I asked. We only arrived yesterday, and I don't think we've spoken to more than a handful uh, of Paisaeans. Yet the monster over there knew us, and I'm sure I'd remember him. I know all about the comings and goings of all American nationals in Paisaia, he said smugly. Your uh, country has been a source of much inconvenience to me, and I am a thorough man, as there are many lieutenants. Diego is one. Pedro is another. I cannot abide a lieutenant who, do, uh, who loses his head. He holstered his gun and, uh, and entered the room, and I struggled to my feet with Mary's help. We clung together, and she trembled violently. El Supremo looked about. Failed to find a place to sit, he strode to the operating table, 
shoved the wounded and unconscious shoulder off onto the hard floor quite casually, and sat down with his da legs dangling over the edge. Kareen went for him, but before she covered three feet, the giant Diego intercepted her and lifted her clear off her feet. She struck at his face with batted fists, but he appar uh, apparently didn't seem to notice. Uh, she was sobbing with rage. Diego, said Miranda with a grin, since you do not uh, seem to be content unless you have a woman in your hands, why don't you take the young lady to my apartments and keep her there until I come, eh? Mary and I cried out. My friends, said Miranda, still grinning, this is only justice. I had a woman, Rosa, and she was heart of my heart. She was killed last night by an American cannon shell. Because of your country, I have no woman. It only seems fair that America give me a woman. I prefer an unmarried woman and I uh, do not think the sister of a minister's wife will disappoint me. He laughed a gay laugh that froze my blood. There is that about martial law, I heard myself say. It's selective. Explain, El Samino, Supremo barked. I believe the man on the floor over there was shot for attempted rape, I said quietly. Padre, said the tall revolutionary, drawing his gun again. In the absence of a lawful constitution for Paisaia, I must do the best I can myself. Occasionally I may be inconsistent, as I am now in uh, sentencing you and your wife to ten years imprisonment for disturbing the peace. But you will find that there is, a, uh, is this about martial law. It is effective. The next twenty minutes were the last three minutes I would spend for ten years and the last uh, free minute that's of Mary's life, but I don't uh, remember one of them. El Supremo marched us at gunpoint across the plaza to the palace, down many flights of stairs, to the lowest of the three basement floors which made up the palace's dungeons. There he locked us uh, personally into a 9 by 12 stone cell and left. We were there for nine years, and I will not speak of those years. After Mary died, I was alone there for 11 months longer, and I will not think of those months. I will only say that in the first weeks, I thanked God for giving Miranda the spark of humanity, which caused him uh, to put both Mary and me in the same cell. But soon, as I began to see the subtlety and horror of his true intent, I came to curse him with black hatred. Ten years inside a stone cube with no heat, no ventilation, and a pail for a toilet can do uh, uh, much to a marriage. And that Mary and I sur survived as long as we did was, I assure you, only due to the depth and strength of her character. And even she couldn't keep me from losing my faith in God. The minister was silent, staring into his glass as the, uh, uh, he read there a strange and terrible secret which uh, he could not quite believe. The stillness was absolute, no flames danced in the fireplace. I caught Doc Webster's eye, and he seemed to come back from somewhere else with a start. What happened to Corrine? he asked hoarsely. Humptman put down his glass suddenly and looked around at us incuriously. I've been told she died that night, he said conversationally. I rather hoped it's true. Miranda was... an animal. Couldn't the American Embassy do anything to get you out? asked Long Drink quickly. I saw Callahan nod approval. The American Embassy, replied a Humptman bitterly, neither had the slightest knowledge of our incarceration nor cared to know. If any, anyone at all was aware of our presence in Paisaia, he must have assumed uh, we'd been killed in the uprising, and he undoubtedly heaved a great sigh when he realized he had no idea who to send condolences to. His words came like machine gun bullets now. We were listed in the prison records as Hidalgo, Tomasillo, and Maria subversives. And that was quite good enough uh, for the State Department, if they checked at all. El Supremo was uh, quite an embarrassment to the United States. And when they had him assassinated two years later, the puppet presidenses uh, were installed, uh, were far too busy entertaining American oil executives to be bothered inspecting the palace dungeons. The only human we saw for nine years was a perpetually drunken sailor who uh, brought it, uh, such of our food as what he hadn't eaten himself. I'd be there now, except that when, when, when Mary died, they... 
He broke off, got a fresh grip on himself, and continued. Someone noticed her body being removed for burial and became curious as to why uh, Maria Hidalgo looked like an American. It was a year before I was released, owing to, let me see now, political complications of an extremely delicate nature in the Middle East, I think they said. My God, I just realized what they meant. It sounded insane at the time, and I hadn't thought about it since. He laughed bitterly. Well, what do you know? Anyway, for the last six months, uh, I was there. I had uh, Red Cross food and a blanket, and so that was hunky-dory. Turned out there was a man uh, from Baltimore four cells down, uh, part of the hospital staff, and he was released too. If Mary hadn't died, we'd both still be there. The minister laughed again, gumped down the rest of his gin and gin, and made a face. She was always uh, getting me out of scrapes. More gin appeared before him, and he gulped noisily. You know, he said with a dangerous high note in his voice, in all the nine years, the prayers never stopped rising from that filthy little cell. For the first three years, we prayed that someone uh, uh, would dispose of El Supremo. For approximately the next three years, uh, we prayed uh, constantly that my faith in God would return. Then for about a year, I prayed to, I don't know who, that Mary would live. After malaria took her, I spent my time praying to anyone who would listen for a chance to kill El Supremo with my own hands. I mean to say, isn't it ironic? All that prayer, and none of it did the slightest good. El Supremo was dead all the time. I never seemed uh, to get my belief back, and Mary? He broke off short and began to laugh softly, a laugh that got shriller and shriller until the glass burst in his hand. He then just sat and looked uh, at his bleeding palm until Doc Webster came over and gently took it away from him. Well, at least this damaged thing is disinfected, uh, the Doc grumbled, but don't uh, ever pull that with an empty glass. Someone uh, fetched his battered black bag and he began applying dressing. Along about that point, everyone in the place uh, got real interested in the floor or the ceiling. It somehow didn't seem as though there was a single intelligent thing that could be said, and it was slowly becoming necessary that somebody say something. Callahan was right there. Reverend, he rumbled, hooking a thumb into his belt. That's a right sad story. I've heard an awful lot of blues and can't say I ever heard worse. What I would like to have explained to me is how, if you follow me, the hell does all this bring you into my joint with a heater in your fist? There was steel in his voice, and the minister looked up sharply, guilt replacing the agony on his features. Bravo, Callahan, I thought. See, I knew uh, what the preacher couldn't, that when uh, there's anger in Callahan's voice, it's uh, got to be theatrics, because when Callahan is good and truly pissed off, he don't bother to talk at all. The little minister uh, was a while finding words. You see he said finally as the dog finished banishing his hand. It was ten years. Ten years. I... I don't know if you can understand what I mean. I know it's been two years since Mary died. It's not just that. But you see, she was all I knew for a long time, and now I don't know anything at all. You must understand, all that time we never saw a newspaper, a magazine, or a TV broadcast never heard so much as a radio. We had utterly no communications with the outside world. We were as isolated as two human beings can be. Hell, said Tommy Jansen. That sounds like what I could use to straighten out my head once and for all. I was thinking about Theodore uh, Sturgeon's story called And Now the News, and I kind of agreed with Tommy, which shows how well Al had read the story. Straighten your head out, Hunton exploded. Now you know perfectly well what the boy means, Long Drink interceded. No one is saying those years weren't nightmares for you, but you know, they were uh, nothing to write home to mother about for us. You missed a lot of turmoil, a lot of bad times, and a lot of trouble. And maybe, uh, in at least, you were better off. I know most of us are, uh, have probably wished uh, we could have gotten away from everything for a long spell, and you did it. What's wrong with isolation? 
Nothing per se, Umpton said quietly. The problem is this. The world won't wait for you. You drop out for more than a short time, and brother, the world goes on without you. I think, Callahan said slowly, I begin to see what you mean. You don't even begin, said Humpton flatly. You can't. You're too close to it. The whole world turns upside down in ten years, but you don't turn upside down, but you turn upside down with it, and, and so to you, it's right side up. It all happens over days and weeks and months, and most people can adapt that fast. But I don't recognize the first thing about this world. I didn't live through it. Let me give all you good people a history lesson. He got up, walked to the bar, put out his hand. Callahan uh, put a glass of gin in it. He turned, faced us all, took a long swallow, and cleared his th uh, throat pedantically. Mary and I left for Pisea in February of 1963, he said. I have since had occasion to supplement my own memories with references from the New York Times, and you may find uh, some of them interesting. On the day of our departure, for instance, there had been a total of 33 Americans killed in Vietnam since the start of the U.S. involvement. Not that anyone was aware of it. It wasn't until a few days after we left uh, that Senator Mansfield's study group issued a warning that the Vietnam struggle was becoming, becoming an American war that cannot be justified by present U.S. security interests in the area. Why the godforsaken place was costing us a whole $400 million a year. Of course, General O'Donnell replied the next day that all those combat pilots uh, among the, quote, advisors, unquote, were there to train Vietnamese, not to take part in the war themselves. A lot happened since then, hasn't it? How about another area, my friends? On November of 1962, Edine Monroe of Harvard University warned undergraduates against use of the stimulant LSD that depresses the mind and censored Professors Alpert and Leary for promoting its use. Dr. Leary replied that hysteria could only hamper research and pointed to the absence of any evidence that the drug was harmful. In California, meanwhile, authorities uh, were sounding a familiar warning note concerning a newly discovered drug which was becoming to appear on the streets. It was called uh, methadrine. The New American Church was still fighting unsuccessfully for the right to continue using peyote for its religious ceremonies, a practice which predated white settlement in America. Henry Ansler had just retired as head of the Federal Narcotics Agency, and there was some talk of controlling the sale of airplane glue to those under 18. Incidentally, while Larry and Alpert, who I understand calls himself Ram Das lately, found little difficulty in preserving their academic autonomy, others were not so lucky. Professor Koch was fired from Illinois University for daring to suggest in print that uh, premarital sexual relations should be, in some cases, condoned. By the time Mary and I got on the boat, the efforts of the American University Professors Association to have him reinstated had been entirely fruitless. A month after we left, the Illinois Supreme Court uh, declined to intervene. Uh, whatever his masters and Johnston were doing, they weren't talking about it. The sexual revolution was still uh, being vigorously and uh, apparently successfully ignored. Hard to remember back ten years, isn't it? How about the space race? The latest news I've heard pu uh, puts us quite a few moon landings and space probes ahead of the Russians, and most people I've spoken to seem to assume uh, that it was always that way. America has felt pretty cocky about uh, the Big Deep for quite a while now. Did you know that by February of 1963, the Russian Vostok series had racked up 130 orbits, a total of 192 hours in space, while the U.S. had a total of 12 orbits and 20 hours? A couple of years later, President Kennedy, remember him, had publicly uh, committed us to putting a man on the moon in the next decade. He was widely pronounced deranged. Eight years later, Armstrong took the first lunar walk and the nation yawned. Oh, you people are so damn blasé about it all. I could go on for hours. When I dropped out, assassination had not yet become commonplace. JFK had not been canonized. RFK was just arguing his first case in any court as Attorney General of the United States. Cinerama was just getting started, hailed as the wave of the future. 
and the New York World's Fair had not yet opened. Two months after we left, Cleopatra premiered, and 20th Century, 20th Century, uh, 20th Century Fox uh, uh, stock dropped $2 a share. Humpton broke off, began to laugh hysterically. Callahan reached across the bar and gripped his shoulder with a hand like a stake, but the minister shook his head. I'm all right, he mentioned, choking with laughter. Just that I haven't told you the funniest joke of all. It nearly killed me at the time, and I didn't dare uh, break up. You see, when I was finally released, they brought me directly to Washington, where some very cheerless men wanted to ask me a number of questions and help me memorize what, they, uh, what had officially happened. But first they decided to compensate me for my troubles uh, with the thrill of a lifetime. I was conveyed before the president's, uh, president of the United States for a hearty hand slap and thought I was going to faint uh, from holding in the laughter. I hadn't thought to ask who the president was, you see. I didn't seem a a especially important after all I'd been through, and I didn't expect I'd recognize the name, but when Richard Nixon held out his hand, I thought I'd die. You see, three months before I left, Nixon lost the race for governor of California and I assured, and assured the press with tears in his eyes that they wouldn't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. This time, the whole place broke up, and Doc Webster almost lost his tonsils trying to whoop and swallow at the same time. Fast Eddie tried to uh, swing into Don't Make Promises You Can't Keep, but he was laughing so hard he couldn't find the keys and a barrage of glasses at the fireplace all around the room. Which was fine for catharsis. But as the laughter trailed off, we realized that the catharsis was not enough for Tom Humpton. He was, uh, his, as, impassioned, as his impassioned words uh, sank in, it began to dawn on all of us. We had adopted, uh, adapted to an awful lot in ten years, and in some crazy way, this confrontation with a man who was forced to try and swallow a whole new world in one gulp seemed to drive home to all of us just how imperfectly we had adapted ourselves. You know, Long Drink drawled in a sudden silence, the little man has a point. Been a lot going on lately. It occurs to me, Tony Jensen said softly, that ten years ago I never heard the word heroin, and he gulped his beer. Ten years ago, Doc Webster mused, I thought that heart transplants were the providence of science fiction writers. Ten years ago, Slippery Jew Joe breathed wistfully, I was single. I was thinking that ten years ago I wore a crew cut and listened to Jerry Lee Lewis and Fats Domino. Christ, I said, as the, uh, the impossible burst opening. No one e ever heard of the Beatles in 1963. The whole electric sound, the respectability of rock and its uh, permeation in all other forms of pop music had taken place while Huntman was rotting in his cell, listening to his fingernails growing. What must the music of today sound like to him? Jim McGunn of the Birds had uh, pointed out in the late 60s that the Beatles had signaled a change in the very sound of music. He compared uh, pre-Beatles music to the bass roar of a propeller plane and the ensuing post-Beatles rock to the metallic whine of a jet engine. From what I hear on the radio, it seems we're already up to the transonic shrieking of a rocket exhaust. And Humpton was getting it all at once from Paul Anka to Alice Cooper in one jump. Why, the sartorial uh, and to uh, uh, tonal changes alone were enough to boggle the mind. We all stared at him, thinking we understood. But he looked around at us and shook his head and took another drink. No, he said. We still don't understand. What you're uh, just beginning to see is what I would, if I were a science fiction writer, call the time traveler's dilemma. Future shock. I believe they're calling it now. But my problem is uh, the tie drama, uh, time traveler's second dilemma. Transplant shock. You see, you're all time travelers too, through too. Traveling through time at a rate of one second per second. In the past few minutes, you've all been made acutely aware of just how much time you have passed through in the last ten years. And it made you think. But I've traveled ten years all at once and I don't have your advantages. Strange as this particular time is to you, you have roots woven into its fabric, 
You have a place in it, however tenuous. And most important of all, you have a purpose. Don't you understand? I was a minister. I was charged with the responsibility for the spiritual development of other human beings. I was trained to help them live moral lives, to make right choices and difficult decisions, and to comfort them when they needed comfort. And now, I don't even begin to grasp their problems, let alone the new tools people like me have, have been jerry-rigging over the past ten years to help them. Why, I went to a fellow cleric for advice, and he offered me a marijuana cigarette. I called an old acquaintance of mine, a Catholic priest, and his wife answered the phone. I told her I had the wrong number and hung up. The whole Watergate affair is no uh, revelation to anyone who was in Paisa uh, in 1963. It's been a long time since I believed Uncle Sam was a, was a virgin. But I used to be in a, the minority. Gentlemen, how can I function as a minister when I don't even begin to comprehend one single one of the moral issues of the day? When I can't, because I haven't lived through, uh, through the events that gave them birth. He finished off his gin, left the glass on the table, and began tracing designs on the mo of the moisture it had left there. I've looked for other work. I've looked for other work for nearly six months now. Are any of you here out of work? which was a shame him saying that because it caused me uh, to pitch a, a perfectly good glass of Bushmills into the fireplace. Humpton nodded and turned to the red-haired mountain behind the bar. And that, Mr. Callahan, he said quietly, is a long of short of why you find me in your establishment with a pistol I bought in an alleyway from a young hare with more hair than Mary used to have. I simply don't know what else to do. He looked around at all of us. And now... That didn't work either, so there's only one thing left I can do. He heaved a great sigh and his shoulders twitch. I wonder if I'll get to see Mary again. Now, we're a reasonably bright bunch at Callahan's, with some notable exceptions, and nobody in the room figured that the one thing Huntman had left to do was start up a chain letter. But at the same time, we're a humane bunch, with a fanatical concern for individual liberty. And so we couldn't do any of the conventional things, like try to talk him out of it, or call the police, or have him fitted for the jacket that's all sleeves. Truth to tell, maybe one or two of us agreed with him that he had no alternative. We were pretty shaken by his story, is all I can say in our defense. Because if we just sat there and stared at him, and felt helpless, and the science, silence became a tangible thing that throbbed in your temples, made your eyes sting, and then Callahan cleared his throat. To be or not to be, he declaimed in a voice like a foghorn, that is the question. Like I said, we're a bright bunch, but it took us a second. By the time we got it, Callahan had already lumbered out from behind the bar, swept a pitcher and three glasses to the floor, and wrapped uh, a tablecloth around him like a toga. Doc Webster was grinning openly. Listen, you goddamn fathead, Callahan uh, declaimed with his hokey uh, uh, tones of a Shakespearean ham. Tis well nobler to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune than to take arms against a sea of trouble and by his opposing let him lick you. Nay, fuck that. His eyes roll, uh, rolled, his huge hands sawed the air as he postured and orated. Humpman stared blankly, his mouth open. Doc Webster heaved himself up onto a chair, harumphed noisily, and struck a pose. Do not go gentle into that good night, he began passionately. Suddenly Callahan's place became a madhouse, something like a theater might be if actors uh, tuned up, as a cacophony uh, as do orchestras. Everyone suddenly became the ghost of Barrymore, or thought he had and the air filled with praises of life and courage uh, delivered in the most impassioned histrionic manner. I unpacked my old guitar and joined Fast Eddie in a rousing chorus of Pack Up Your Sorrows. I, I guess among us all, we made a hell of a racket. All right, all right, Callahan bellowed after a few minutes of pandemonium. I th reckon that ought to do, gents. I think we took the Oscar. He returned to Huntman and tossed the tablecloth on the floor. Well, Reverend, he growled. Can you top that performance? Little Minister looked up at him for a long spell. 
and then he began to laugh and laugh. It was a different kind of laugh than we'd heard from him before. It had no ragged edges and no despair in it. It was a full, deep belly laugh. And instead of grating on your nerves like a knife uh, on piano wire, it made us feel warm and proud and relieved. Kind of a tribute to our act. Gentlemen, he said finally, clapping his hands feebly, still chuckling, I concede. I've been outacted fair and square. I couldn't try to compete with a performance like that. Then, all at once, he sobered and looked at all of us. I... I didn't know people like you still existed in the world. I... I think I can make it now. I'll find some kind of work. It's just that... Well, if anyone else knows how tough it is, then it's all right. The corners of his mouth lifting in a happy smile met a flood of tears on their way down. Thank you, my friends. Thank you. Any time, said Callahan, and meant it. The door banged inevitably open, and we swung around to see a young black kid, chest heaving, frame the doorway with a .38 police uh, uh, positive in his hand. Never be quiet and nobody's going to get hurt, he said, shrilly, and stepped inside. Callahan seemed to swell around the shoulders, but he didn't move. Everybody was uh, frozen, thinking for the second time that night that we should have been expecting it. And all of us, and of all of us, only Huntman refused to be uh, numbed by the shock anymore. Only Huntman kept his head, and only Huntman remembered. It all happened very quickly then, as it had to happen. Callahan's shotgun was behind the bar, out of reach, and Fast Eddie had been caught with uh, both hands in sight. The minister caught Doc Webster's eye, and they exchanged a meaningful glance across the room. I didn't understand. Then, uh, the doc cleared his throat. Excuse me, young man, he began, when the kid turned to tell him to shut up, and behind him, Huntman sprang from his chair, headlong across the room, and head first towards the fireplace. He landed on his stomach, and his hands plowed straight into the welter of broken glass. As he wrenched over on his back, his right hand came around with his big .45 in it, and the kid was still turning to see what the noise from behind him was. They froze that way for a long moment. Huntman sprawled in the fireplace, the kid by the bar, and the two muzzles stared unblinking across the room at each other. Then Callahan spoke. You'll hit, hurt him with a .38, son, but he'll kill you with a .45. The kid froze, his eyes darting around the room then flung his uh, gun from him and bolted for the door with a noise uh, like a cross between a sneeze and a snob. sob. Nobody got in his way. Then Callahan spoke up again. You see, Tom, he said conversationally, moral issues never change, only social ones. One thing I'll say for the boys at Callahan's, they can keep a straight face. Nobody cracked a smile as Callahan uh, fed the, the cops the perfectly hilarious yarn about how the minister had disarmed a thief uh, with a revolver and had only that afternoon uh, taken from a troubled young parishioner. Some of us had even argued against involving the police at all on general principles. I was one of them. But Callahan insisted that he didn't want any guns in his joint and nobody else really wanted them either. But when I was uh, the proudest of the boys, and when the police asked for a description of the thief, thief none of us had given any thought uh, to that. But Dog Webster was right on there, his dragon-in-the-shower voice drowning out all others. Description, he boomed? Hell, nobody was ever easier to describe. The guy was six foot four with a hooked nose, blonde hair, blue eyes, and a scar uh, from left to right, from ear to chin. And he had one leg. And not one of us so much as blinked as the cop dutifully wrote that down. Perhaps that kid would have another chance. Tom Humptman, however, uh, didn't come off so well in the aplomb department. As one of the cops was uh, phoning it in, Blonde Drink called out, Hey Tom, one thing I don't understand. That cannon you had was in the fireplace for a good hour or so, and that hearth is plenty warm um, even when the fire's been out for a while. How the hell uh, come, uh, none of the charges went cartridges went off. The minister looked puzzled. Why? I have no idea. Do you suppose that... 
but the second cop was making strangling sounds and uh, waving the point four five as he found his voice. You mean you didn't know? We looked at him. He tossed the gun to Callahan, who one-handed it easily, and then suddenly looked startled. He hefted the gun and his jaw dropped. There's no clip in this gun, he said faintly. The damn thing's unloaded. Tom Huntman fainted dead away. By the time uh, we recovered from that one, Callahan decided uh, Doc and Noah and I, I were Punday night champions and were helping ourselves to one more free drink with Tom Humpman uh, when Doc came up with an idea. Say, Mike, he called out, don't you think a bunch of savvy galoots like us uh, could find Tom's, uh, Tom here some kind of a job? Well, I tell you, Doc, said Callahan, scratching his neck, I've been giving that some thought. He lit a cigar and regarded the minister with a professional eye. Tom, do you know anything about tending bar? Huh? Why, yes, I do. I tended bar for a couple of summers before I entered the ministry. Well, Callahan drawled, I ain't getting any younger. Uh, this all day and all night stuff is okay for someone your age. But I'm pushing 50. Why, I hit a man last week and he got, got up on me. I've been meaning to get myself a little part-time help sort of distribute the load a little and I'd be right honored to, to give a man of God uh, uh, to get a man of God to serve my booze a murmur of shock ran through the bar an expression of awe at the honor of being uh, accorded to Tom Humpman he looked around having the sense to see uh, what it was up to and what and what Callahan was doing why the hell not roared long drink and the dog together and the minister began to cry Mr. Callahan, he said, I'd be proud to help you run this bar. About that point, a rousing cheer went up, and two dozen glasses uh, met above the newly relit blaze in the fireplace. Toasts got proposed all at once, and a firecracker went off somewhere in the back room. The minister was lifted up onto a couple or three shoulders, and a most god-awful alley cat off-key chorus of uh, you ever heard assured him that he was indeed a jolly good fellow. This calls for another drink, Callahan decreed. What'll it be, Tom? Well, uh, the minister sa uh, uh, said, I've had an awful lot of gin, and I really haven't got back into training yet. I think I'd better have a horse's ass. Reverend, said Callahan, very chagrined, whatever it is, you're going to get it on the house, because I ain't ever heard of it. All around the room, conversations chopped off in mid-sentence as the news was assimilated. The last time in my memory when Callahan got taken for a drink was in 1968 when some joker in a uh, pork pie hat asked him for a mother superior. It turned out to be a martini with a prune in it, and Callahan by God went out and bought a prune. Humpton blinked at, at the commotion he was causing and finally managed, uh, well, uh, it, you won't see it back, set you back very much. It's just a ginger ale with a cherry in it. He paused, uh, and apparently embarrassed, and continued uh, just a shade too uh, defensively. You see, they ca uh, call that to be, because anyone who'd order one is a horse's ass, chorused a dozen voices with him, and a shower of peanuts hit him from all over the room. Tommy Jansen, he, he had a half-full pitcher at the fireplace. If had steady, he snatched it out of the air with his right hand as he uh, as his left picked up. You said it, not me, in F sharp. Huntman accepted his drink from Callahan, and, and as he had it, lips before, had it to his lips before, he noticed the remarkably authentic-looking plastic fly, which Callahan had thoughtfully added to the prescription. The explosion was impressive. I swear, a uh, ginger ale came out of his ears. Seemed like a likely place to find a fly, said Callahan loudly, and somehow Fast Eddie managed to heave the pitcher at him without interrupting his song. Callahan uh, fielded it deftly and took a long drink. That's what I like to see, he boomed, replacing the cigar in his teeth. A place that's merry. And that, folks, brings us to the end of The Time Traveler. I thought about sharing these uh, some of these stories with you in part to change the tone a bit from where we were, uh, were with the uh, last few weeks with Dracula. But I also thought that story in particular, we all get used to times as they go by and we assimilate them 
as best we can, but not always the best way it could be. I hope you take, uh, take some of the time that we all have now to ju uh, just reflect on yourselves and the world and what really matters. I'd like to take a moment also to uh, reflect and thank our good minstrel Ryan for uh, giving us their, our ever-present ambiance. I also want to thank all you good listeners out there. Stay safe, stay thoughtful, and as always, be kind. Until next time, this is VFR signing off.